Without any more ado, uh, uh, tonight's speaker is uh, speaking uh, on uh, George Orwell uh, and on a former member's, uh, or current member's, uh, book called Orwell, Your Orwell by David Ramsey Steele. And uh, his, his talk, the title of his talk is... Uh, uh, David Steele's uh, Correct Thoughts on George Orwell. Uh, um, uh, okay, yeah. Well, this, this, is, this is a book. Um, it's quite substantial, over 300 pages, uh, written by, uh, as uh, David McDonough said, written by uh, David Ramsey Steele, who was a founding member of the uh, Libertarian Alliance in this country. Um, uh, it's an interesting book, and what I thought I would do is give you a, a flavor of it in, in a little talk and try and encourage you to buy it. I'm sure you can uh, find it on Amazon or just Google it somewhere. So uh, what, what's the book about, basically? Well, it's, um, it's a detailed and critical examination of Orwell's beliefs. And it's one that actually clashes quite often with the uh, received wisdom on Orwell. Uh, that's a, that's pro probably the most important thing. The second thing is that uh, Orwell's beliefs are put in the context of the intellectual and political history of Europe in the 20th century, particularly the first half of the 20th century. So if you're interested in the clash between capitalism and socialism, or of the struggle between democracy and totalitarianism, that, um, then this is a book that will interest you. And uh, finally, the book <coughs> often criticizes and debunks uh, a number of the views which intellectuals held in the first part of the uh, 20th century. And it does that some, quite often from a classical liberal perspective. So um, that itself is interesting to people like us. But I, I'll, I'll stress again that this book's more to do with Orwell uh, and his views than anything else. Um, the picture I think that a lot of people have of Orwell is that he stood outside the um, run of the mill, that he had his own particular way of looking at things on the left. He was a left winger, but he had his own little way of um, looking at things. And this book, I think, makes pretty clear that this is, in fact, not true. Uh, Orwell was part of a big uh, movement in the 30s and 40s of the British left. And um, he simply subscribed to the majority of what they accepted. He did criticize certain leftist views, that's true. But he would always do it from, an, from within another left-wing perspective. So, I mean, one of the things that people think, well, he, he maybe went out on a limb against communism. But in fact, most of the uh, Labour Party in the 1930s were opposed to communism. Uh, Bertrand Russell, who was very influential in the interwar period, um, was very strongly anti-communist. He, uh, since he, he made a visit there in around about 1920, and he wrote a book called the practice and theory of Bolshevism. And this was very cr critical of the Bolsheviks. Um, and also, again, I, I stress that Orwell was very careful about uh, how he opposed communism. Um, his first really successful book was Animal Farm. And um, the, when that came out, the Duchess of Athol, who was a, an anti-communist campaigner on the right of the political spectrum in Britain, uh, in 1945, asked Orwell to speak, uh, late 1945, November 1945, uh, in a meeting against Soviet actions in Europe. And Orwell refused, he said, um, he belonged to the left and he couldn't be associated with a right-wing group linked to uh, that particular meeting. Um, so if Orwell wasn't uh, particularly uh, out on a limb in his views. What were his, um, what were his actual uh, views? What were his orthodoxies, shall we say? Well, he was a democratic socialist in the line of Keir Hardy, Bernard Shaw, Bertrand Russell, and R.H. Tawney, you know, very mainstream. Um, he wanted to nationalize most of the British economy, abolish the House of Lords, equalize incomes, and end the British Empire. But. I mean, uh, those measures, what I'm just saying now, were not particularly controversial on the left in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, if you were a socialist in the 1930s and 40s, 
That meant favouring the abolition of private ownership of factories, mines, big farms, railroads and banks. Large-scale productive enterprises would not be owned by individuals, but by the community as a whole. Production would not be left to the uh, anarchic vagaries of the market, but would be consciously planned for the benefit of the whole of society. I mean, this is fairly standard socialist stuff at the time. Uh, David Steele's book actually mentions uh, uh, a book by uh, an, a, a influ hugely influential socialist called Robert Blatchford. Uh, Blatchford, sorry. Uh, and this was uh, Merry England, and it was published in the late, um, in the 1890s. Very uh, big bestseller, and he popularized uh, this view of socialism. Uh, Blatchford's prime exhibit in favor of state ownership was the Postal Service, which was already owned by the state, of course. And uh, he said, I, I quote, the Postal Service is a standing proof of the capacity of the state to manage the public business with economy and success. And uh, Blatchford also made a distinction between the practical socialism and ideal socialism. And the first kind involved everyone still working for wages, whereas the second kind was where goods and services were provided for free. And he, Blatchford thought that the second form would eventually uh, supplant the first form of socialism. And uh, I, this was a very uh, influential book, and I think these ideas were very uh, very popular in the, uh, on the left. You have to remember that the Labour government of 1945-50 uh, nationalised about 20% of the British economy, and the Attlee government also started to offer goods free at the point of demand and delivery. And um, it's really only after 1950 that the Labour Party slowly moved to the right on economic matters. Uh, for instance, Corbyn, uh, who's um, is always in the news now, and is regarded as an extreme left-winger, by the standards of Orwell's day, he would be rather on the right of the Labour Party of, of that time. Um, so from the mid from mid-1936 until the end of his life, which was 1950, Orwell was a socialist who looked at the economy in this way. Um, he did, he, he did um, adjust his position on certain issues, but his outlook on the economy didn't seem to change very much. Um, Christopher Hitchens <clears throat> wrote a book on Orwell, and he, he tried to rescue this um, picture of uh, Orwell as a, a maverick. And he, he said that Orwell stands out as someone unique on the left because he had no truck with imperialism, fascism, or Stalinism. He said, uh, Hitchens said that most of the intellectual class had been compromised by some sort of accommodation with one of these ideologies. And uh, David, David Steele looks at these quite closely, and there's really nothing, nothing in it. Um, let's, look, we'll, we'll let's look at it one, um, one by one, look at these things one by one. So imperialism, uh, we, should, we should say initially that um, the British Empire really, it meant, uh, to most imperialists, it meant India. Uh, that, was the, that was the jewel in the crown, as it was called. Uh, by the 1930s, the, um, the white dominions, as they were called, Australia, Canada, were pretty, to all intents and purposes, were self-governing. And really, the only question amongst intellectuals and most politicians was the speed at which India would reach dominion status, i.e. it would be at the same status as places like Australia and Canada. And... Um, this was a position of the left and uh, much of the right as well. Uh, for instance, Stanley Baldwin, who was a conservative prime minister for much of the interwar period and was regarded as absolutely middle of the road, right of center, uh, was of the opinion that the mission of the British Empire was to bring about its own extinction by granting gradual self-government to the colonies. There was a die-hard group of imperialists of uh, uh, the tr traditional sort, and they were led by Churchill in the Tory party, but they were a minority. And they couldn't stop even the Government of India Act in 1935. The Government of India Act in 1935, by the way, granted more self-government to India. I mean, it didn't give them the Dominion status or anything like that, but it, it granted more power. And Churchill and uh, uh, the diehards opposed it, 
but uh, they could they couldn't they couldn't prevent it coming into um, law. Uh, when the Labour government came into uh, power in 1945, it moved rapidly to grant dominion status to what became India, Pakistan, Burma, and Ceylon. Remember that British India has become India, Pakistan, Burma, Ceylon, and Bangladesh, actually. Um, so by 1947, all these countries were de facto independent. Um, and the Conservatives in opposition didn't even bring the matter to a vote. They didn't think it would be remotely controversial enough. Um, so all was position on the empire. It wasn't particularly controversial at all. Um, and it was shared by uh, most people on the left and uh, the majority of the right, I would say. Um, on fascism again, Hitchens uh, makes a deal, a big deal about this, but there's nothing unusual about Orwell's position on fascism. Uh, he was opposed to it, as were most of, was most of the left. The only slightly controversial thing was the stance that the left took towards the fascist powers, that, by which I mean Germany, Italy, and uh, Spain. Um, and uh, Hitchens could have meant that um, the intellectuals on the left were compromised because many of them were strongly anti-fascist, but were also strongly opposed to rearmament in the 1930s. And of course, rearmament would have enabled Britain to fight more effectively against the uh, fascist powers. But as um, I'm going to make clear shortly, Orwell himself adopted this position between, uh, I would say, contradictory position between 1937 and 1939. And in August 1939, he suddenly changed uh, from this uh, anti-fascism but anti-war uh, line to uh, anti-fascist and pro-war line. And then he spent the next six years attacking the people who'd um, stuck to the line which he held between 1937 and 1939. Um, as for communism, well, I briefly mentioned that already, but um, uh, always opposition to communism after 1937 was shared by uh, many other left-wingers, uh, Bertrand Russell, Fenner Brockway, Clifford Allen, and most of the Labour Party. And there's never really been a significantly sized Communist Party in the UK, unlike uh, many continental countries. Uh, since the 1920s, the Labour Party prescribed the Communist Party and its various front organisations and expelled people who were found to have become entangled with the Communists. So Orwell was once again really uh, in the mainstream here. Uh, David Steele uh, gives an indication of the uh, position. In 1949, Richard Crossman, who, was, um, who became the Labour minister in the 1960s, and was a bit of an intellectual, he edited a book called The God That Failed. And it was a book about um, six notable writers who had initially been uh, committed communists, had become disillusioned and quit the movement. Uh, but Crossman could hardly find a single convincing British example of a former uh, communist, intellectual, turned anti-communist. And he had to make do with the poet, uh, Stephen Spender, who had been briefly a member of the Communist Party for a few weeks and really wouldn't be regarded as a significant um, intellectual. Um, I mentioned that Orwell was pretty mainstream on the economic um, economic uh, views of the time, uh, but his, he, he modified his ideas in other ways. And uh, this book actually does give you a, a quite uh, detailed look at uh, this. And um, Orwell didn't become. Uh, um, a socialist until 1936, around about the time he wrote The uh, Road to Wigan Pier. And um, before that, there's not a great deal known about his views, although um, I think he was anti-capitalist. Um, he wrote a book called um, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, in which he, uh, the hero there, criticizes 
you know, commercialism and advertising and stuff like that. But he, he wasn't, when he wrote that book, he wasn't actually a communist, sorry, a socialist. And um, it seems that from mid-36, when he first became a socialist, till mid-37, he was a supporter of the Popular Front, which was a, a wide uh, organization, which included communists. They tried, it tried to present as broad a front as possible um, of socialists and people on the left. And I think he was a supporter of that. Uh, but then he went and fought in Spain in the uh, uh, civil war there. And um, he was almost killed twice. Once he was hit by a bullet by uh, Franco's forces, I believe. And that almost, he was hit in the neck and that almost killed him. And then later on, he was in Barcelona and the communists there launched uh, a sort of mini putsch against Trotsky, enemies, their enemies on the left. And um, I think uh, Orwell was fighting with a, uh, a branch of the uh, Republican forces uh, linked to Trotskyites, and um, he was almost killed in that. He just got out of Spain in time, he got back to the UK. Uh, so he was, was almost killed twice, once, uh, once by the fascists, which is probably expected, and um, once by the communists on the left, which he probably didn't expect. And I wonder if that had some effect, some uh, influence on his views on communists after uh, 1937, because he was quite strongly opposed to them. And um, uh, he supported, uh, from mid-37 to August 39, he supported a revolutionary anti-Stalinist left. And he joined the Independent Labour Party during this, during this period, which had its, it's not the Labour Party, it's a different organisation which had its own little slant on. Uh, things. Uh, then in, in August 39, he suddenly switched from this position, which was basically anti-war, uh, to support for the um, anti-fascist war. And in the last 10 years of his life, he would probably be best described as someone on the left wing of the main Labour Party, a Bevinite, say. Um, uh, these two years, 30, 37 to 39, are uh, quite interesting, actually. Um, and it was, it was opposed to uh, a war against um, the fascist powers. And he actually identified the left as uh, the most culpable warmongers. Uh, prior to 1939, the uh, main peace party in the UK was the Moseley's Black Shirts, who were, of course, the British fascists. And uh, Orwell wrote in 19, January 1939, I don't know whether Mosley will have the sense and guts to stick out against a war with Germany. And this position of Orwell's on the war was also strongly hinted at in his, his 1939 novel, Coming Up For Air. Coming Up For Air is an interesting book, actually, and one of his best uh, two novels prior to writing Animal Farm and um, 1984. And it's a story of a, a guy who um, uh, has had enough, really. He's just got a routine job. He's a bit fed up with his family. And he just wants to get away from it for a while. And he, he, tries, to go to, he tries to go back to his, uh, the period when he was growing up before the First World War. This is set, the book is set in the late 1930s. Growing up uh, just before the First World War. Uh, uh, into a kind of idyllic village, but, well, it's idyllic as he remembers it. And it's interesting because Orwell looks at how the changes which happened in the 1920s and 1930s in British society have affected pretty well everything. But at one point, he wanders into a political meeting, does uh, the hero of the uh, Coming Up For Air, which is George, George Bowling, I believe. And um, he's just, Mr. George, George Bowling is just the average guy. And um, there's, a, there's a speaker there who's banging on about the anti, you know, being anti-fascist and resisting the fascists. And the picture that Orwell presents at that meeting is not hooray for this guy who's speaking up about resisting the fascists. 
this position is, is the sort of hate, is trying to engender hate, and this is not what we really want. It's a bit like the, um, the, the bit of the meeting, it's a bit like the 1984 where um, the, uh, there's a hate, they have a, they have a position where they all have to get together and hate Goldstein, I think it is, the opponent of Big, Big Brother. And they have the, it's almost like, a, uh, let's all get together and hate someone. And uh, Orwell is almost presaging that actually in this uh, piece of uh, this scene from uh, Coming Up For Air. And um, I, found, I, I found, for one, found that interesting. It just gives the views of Orwell that he wasn't at all uh, very strong on resisting the fascists. And, um, it, during this period, he, he thought it was perfectly okay to kill capitalists and fascists and priests uh, in a civil insurrection, but it'd be wrong to support one imperialist nation uh, against another. In, in that case, that meant Britain against Germany. And of uh, course, this was, a, this was the position of the independent Labour Party in a significant portion of the left. And um, all well things during this period that the communists through the Popular Front, are trying to get Britain allied with the USSR and thereby into a war with Germany, and I think this is disgraceful. And um, in any case, he thinks you can't defeat fascism by defending capitalist democracy, because he just sees fascism and capitalist democracy as two faces of the same coin. You know, a lot of the left thought fascism was capitalism's last throw of the dice. You know, when you couldn't run capitalism through democracy anymore, the capitalists turned to the fascists to hold the workers' wages down, and they could carry on then uh, in that thing. And um, he also thought at the time, by the way, the British Empire was even worse than fascism, and at the beginning of the war would see fascism imposed in the UK. Not by Mosley, by the way. It wouldn't have been uh, done by Mosley, but he just thought the existing rulers would have uh, imposed fascism. Um, and then suddenly Orwell, in August 1939, he switches uh, to a pro-war position. And he says he had a dream that uh, war had started and that he would support it and even fight in it, if possible. And then he said he came downstairs uh, and then he found the newspaper announced Ribbentrop's flight to Moscow to sign the Nazi-Soviet pact. So, really, before... August 39, Orwell's pointing out a number of things, uh, and th this doesn't get really uh, stressed very much when you see the typical books and Orwell, and he's pointing out one is that Britain's morally no better than Nazi Germany. He's pointing out, he also points out that Germany's a collectivist economy and he thinks that's m the more efficient than Britain. He, he was amongst the many people who thought that, um, that collectivism was the, um, was the way forward. Uh, capitalist democracy is inefficient, it's got no future. It thinks the coming war was an, just an imperialist squabble. Uh, democracy and fascism are just two different ways by which capitalists rule a country. And he thought the UK was liable to turn fascist at any moment. And when he switched to his pro-war position, uh, he went the pro-war and the communists, um, who had been previously uh, strongly anti-fascist pro-war, they, after the Nazi-Soviet pact, of course, they switched completely. So he went one way and they went completely went the other. And the Communist Party um, in, in Britain, and I think gen generally across Europe, they, they were pro-peace. Uh, and um, he, he, by the way, then proceeded to attack the people who held the views which he'd held between 1937 and 1939. That's all. Um, another interesting thing the book covers, which again isn't um, very widely uh, known or uh, stressed, he, he, he was a bit of a reactionary, or he would be in modern terms. Um, he had certain ideas which don't really fit well with current leftist thinking. Um, for instance, he was strongly opposed to birth control, homosexuality and vegetarianism. And uh, the very people whom Orwell saw as a crackpot minority uh, at the time, at his time, 
and he thought they would might well discredit the left, I think have largely been accepted by the left. And in fact, you might see him being embraced by the left, I would say. Um, but oh, well, again, he wasn't particularly isolated there. You know, there was a sort of uh, distaste for these rather effeminate um, middle class manners. And there was a much stronger admiration for the working class, uh, the manual workers, you know, the more rugged types. And you can see that in the literature and the films of the time. Um, but it wasn't just a matter of uh, taste for Orwell. He, had, he, he did have a theory, or he, he, he'd taken up a theory about uh, some of these matters. And um, there were various theories about degeneration at the time. Uh, and one of, one of them was that modernization, and I think Orwell subscribed to this, modernization, that is capitalism, urbanization, industrialization, it had engendered certain shall we say, eccentricities or perversions in uh, society. So it had made life rather rootless, alienating, and somewhat degrading. So, and the certain habits like um, drinking alcohol, taking drugs, a preoccupation with money, a rather, rather morbid mental states, uh, these were the result of man being up, uh, uprooted from his natural habitat. Um, very important for all was the fact that the birth rate in the 1930s had fallen below the level required to maintain the population. And it had been maintained that the um, expansion of cities could only be maintained by immigration from the countryside, and I suppose you would then say from, eventually from other countries. Um, in 1942, Orwell wrote an article, he gave a brief list of qualities by which he believed any society, if it was to last, uh, was to be sustained. They were industry, courage, patriotism, frugality, and what he called uh, philoprogenitiveness, which really means uh, friendliness for, to children. Um, and uh, all agreed with many of the intellectuals in the 1930s that Western civilization was facing the crisis of underpopulation and a collapse in fertility. And that was, for, for him, that was one more reason why Western capitalism hadn't got very long to go. Um, so all those objections to things like birth control and homosexuality were not just knee-jerk, not just knee-jerk reaction. But it, although he does make certain disparaging remarks about homosexuals in, in his uh, writings, for instance, he, he comments on a novel by Cyril Connolly, he, he considers it a sign of spiritual inadequ inadequacy to write about so-called artists who spend on sodomy what they've gained by sponging. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm, it's Christmas, so I'm not going to say a lot, and um, I, I'm going to have a uh, drink shortly. But I, I will say a little bit more about imperialism than I'm going to call it. Um, I'll call it a day. He was um, he was an imperial police officer in Burma uh, during the 1920s, Orwell, for, for five years. He went. He, he went to. Uh, he was a member of the. Um, upper middle class. He went to Eton, but did not then go on to uh, Oxford or Cambridge. And he, he went straight away and joined the um, Imperial Police Force. Um, I think his uh, parents had connection with India. And, uh, but he became disillusioned with the British Empire. And you can read all about it in his novel, uh, Burmese Days, which is, along with Coming Up For Air, probably the, the two best novels prior to um, Animal Farm and uh, 1984. And there's one issue about the empire which uh, obsesses Orwell, actually. And um, he thinks that people in the UK are much better off economically because of the empire. He wrote, we are standing on the backs of half-starved Asiatic coolies. The standard of living of the British working class has been and is artificially high because it is based on a parasitic economy. And um, Orwell believes that uh, one of the immediate effects of giving up the co colonies will be a sudden drop in the standard of living of British workers. And he's furious with the left because they won't complain about this. Um, 
In fact, between the 1937-39, this period which I've talked about, uh, Orwell thought the British Empire was far worse than Nazi Germany. He cites the average income of the non-white subjects in India, which is around about seven pounds a year, as against 80 pounds a year in the UK for a typical worker. And uh, he says, uh, Hitler could not reduce workers' wages to a, to a penny an hour, but the British had achieved this in India. But he never tells us how the British had performed this trick, you know. Um, and uh, I think so quite a lot of the left held that uh, the majority of British people gained from empire, where, whereas classical liberals on the whole think that a small group of people, the imperial class, uh, gained from empire, but most workers, for most workers, it was a burden rather than a benefit. You know, the workers pay taxes to support the, uh, uh, the armed forces which support the empire. And these workers, even on occasion, have to die for an empire. Uh, and Orwell's view throws up, uh, you know, all sorts of puzzles. If the standard of living in countries like the UK depends on uh, the colonies, how was it that there were other European countries like Switzerland and Sweden with no colonies who enjoyed a quite comparable standard of living to the UK? And why didn't wages in India rocket after Indian independence? And um, another thing would, you, you would say was, well, why, why, uh, why were wages in Hong Kong not held back despite the fact that it remained a British colony until 1994, as, as we all know, the, uh, the Hong Kong itself became one of the success stories, post-war economic success stories, despite it being a, a colony, you might say. Um, in fact, I don't think the uh, workers' wages uh, in this country were higher, or purchasing power was higher, and the workers' of wages in the colonies low because of empire. Wages were low in India relative to the UK because India had barely industrialized at the time of the Raj. Uh, in comparison with Europe, productivity in India was very low. And uh, this was the real reason that wages were low in India. Um, and that, gentlemen, is a flavor of the book. And uh, you can ask me some questions. <laughs> John? Despite the title of your talk, I wondered whether you had any reservations about uh, Steele's interpretation of all world. You thought, you know, that's not quite right, or that's not how I see it. Or... Um, not really, no, I, I, I don't think all will. Um... is much different from what uh, David Steele says. I mean, one of the things that uh, is cited often is the uh, difficulty he had in getting Animal Farm published. Uh, but the book deals with this at some length. And it, they, first of all, there wasn't a great deal of difficulty. Uh, he couldn't get his first publisher. Um, and there, I think there was trouble with uh, Faber and Faber, T.S. Eliot. But th remember, this was 1944. And this wasn't because of any um, popularity of communism. It was just because at that time, Britain was allied with the Soviet Union in the war. And, um, uh, you know, that was the reason rather than him standing out against uh, communism for a long period. I think just he chose to get Animal Farm published at that very moment. And even then, even then, there were quite a lot of people who were willing to publish it, but he insisted on going to a, um, a particular publisher who was, um, who was much bigger. Because I think all was sense this might be a hit, actually. Uh, yeah, it seems like uh, um, David Ramsey Steele argues against other biographers of uh, Orwell. It doesn't give any reasons why there is a distorted view of Orwell in many of the biographies. Is there, well, why is there, is there a reason for why he's often being portrayed more of, an, of a unique thinker or an iconoclast than he really was? Um, 
No, I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't think he. He does really. Uh, um, I think there's this. There's, there is the business about animal farm and the fact that he's on the left and he's anti-communist. And a lot of people think that uh, a lot of people on the left in the 30s were fellow travellers, which they weren't. Um, I suspect that's the uh, reason. Um, and um, the thing about Orwell, of course, is that once he'd published Animal Farm and uh, um, 1984, and then he died shortly after that, he became, prior to that, he, he was just a guy who'd written some reasonable novels and some good, some good political literature and was known on the left. But of course, once he published those two books, he, become, he became um, quite popular with the section of the right as well. Um, and across the world, you know, not just in the UK. Bob? Well, there is the idea, is there not, that he opened the eyes of the world to the evils of communism, and that no cleric, no right winger, no ordinary Joe Schmo could do this, but he did. Of course, he did. No, he, um, there's lots of people in. Uh, I mentioned some of them in, in, on the left of the Labour Party who were opposed to the communists. I mean, Russell is a big name. Uh, I mentioned Brockway, but I mean, most of the Labour Party. And um, there's a, a, a trade unionist who he wrote a book on um, Strine, I think. He wrote a book on the Finno Russian War in 1940, and he went there and he was sympathetic towards the, uh, towards the Finns. And um, I think the thing that worried Orwell, and probably quite a lot of people on the left, is they wanted the uh, whole-scale nationalization of the economy. I mean, this is a big thing, of course, about 1984. They wanted the whole-scale nationalization of the economy and economic controls. And uh, Orwell is posing the question, really, uh, and the right liked him for this, and he posed it rather well is whether you can have, with that sort of economy, whether you can actually have freedom of expression, you know, dem democratic uh, socialism as he would have seen it. In other words, freedom of expression, uh, liberal values, which Orwell valued as a writer, of course. And, um, but a lot of, you know, he wasn't the first person to do that. There were quite a lot of people who had been writing about totalitarianism in the 30s and 40s. And the book mentions some of them, discusses them. Leave. Should have shut them up, Steve. What, what Patrick? About, yes, uh, I mean. I'm sure this guy will shut sure. up. <laughs> <laughs> no, he won't shut Patrick up. Where did he get, I mean, is, is it clear where he got this, um, this philosophy? against the, the big state, big, big brother. I mean, when, when ordinary people on the street hear about George Orwell, uh, they immediately think that, um, you know, that he, he's anti-big brother, that he's for the individual. And uh, it's not clear if he's facing his left or right or whatever. Well, I think Orwell had read the books on totalitarianism. Do where that comes from? Yeah, he'd read the books on totalitarianism. There's a writer called Borker now, I think, who'd written some stuff who was particularly known by Orwell. Um, but he knew about the behavior of the communists in Spain, you know, they almost tried to kill him. Uh, he could see that both Nazi Germany and um, communist Russia, they, they, you know, they have very many things in common and uh, you've got to be careful about what you say. There are big pictures of the- uh, Stalin or Hitler? The leader on the wall. Uh, there's one party. Um, um, all that sort of thing and uh, so you know that's um, it's sort of st and of course the, the, throughout the period of Orwell's um, in the 1920s and 30s there's a gradual um, conversion of countries in Europe we don't think about this now because we tend to think democracy is you know uh, quite, quite strong and um, prevalent but in the 1920s and 30s, country after country went from being democratic to being 
fascist or communist, you know. Um, I mean, Italy goes in the early 1920s. Um, lots of countries in Eastern Europe go, um, uh, go during this period. Uh, Spain, of course, the Civil War. Germany is a, is a huge, uh, huge example. And you, it, it's, you know, it's easy to count the countries which are uh, a state democratic in uh, Europe in the interwar period than, uh, than the ones who um, have given up on it. I mean, they, pe people thought democracy was finished, a lot of, uh, a lot of people, that it w wasn't a, a viable system. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, if, if you look in the latest edition of New Scientist, the magazine, New Scientist, you'll see that there's an advertisement there for a chap called John Marsh, who's published a book against liberty, against libertarianism, it's an old page. But, but uh, John Marsh, I don't know if you're familiar with his book, it's called The Delusion of Liberty. I don't know if you're familiar with it with any of that stuff. But if you are, I wonder what, what you think Orwell would make of that. I'm not familiar with it, so... Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's a simple... Uh, that's a simple truth. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. John? I, um, I say if you're going to be a writer, you should always write about what you know. And uh, one of the things that I found interesting about uh, Eric Blair, as you ought to really call him, I suppose, was how much he took for what he knew and he, he, he sort of included it in all of his novels. Um, so, uh, is it the Ministry of Truth? Oh, that, room 101. Uh, well, the Ministry of Truth was Senate House, apparently, based on Senate yeah, yeah. House, right yeah. next door. Yeah. Room 101 was where he worked at the BBC. And the, uh, uh, the ex uh, what you heard on, uh, in uh, 1984, this is Big Brother Calling, this is Big Brother, that was an adapt adaptation of this is the BBC Calling. And he's just taken that and changed it into so I sure, I sure, acronym, Big Brother Calling BBC. Yeah. I, I sure it wasn't um, uh, Lord Ho Ho. The, the uh, Germany calling, Germany yeah, yeah, calling yeah, yeah. during he the war. No, Similar sort of thing. No, yes, obviously, yes, no. Obviously, he heard that. Yeah. He thought of the BBC, and then he thought he could simply change it to this is the this is Big Brother calling. Right. And and it, the fact that it fitted BBC, I think, can't have been a coincidence. Um, because, it, as you say, he saw that if we could just so easily flip to. Um, uh, pardon my collectivism when I say we here, because uh, I wasn't alive at the time, uh, to, to something like that. Um, that and and uh, by including all this sort of stuff, he sort of added there is attitude to the idea that something like this could have happened here so easily. Even if it did, it could have. Yeah. Yes or no? <laughs> Well, um, I get the feeling that um, he does have a yen for the uh, pre-war period. I mean, I think the coming up for air, coming up for air, by the way, I, I, as I mentioned, is I want to get it. I want to get away from it all. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the average bloke and I'm fed up. It's a bit like history, Mr. Polly. Uh, I'm just going to make an escape from it all. And um, he's got some idea of what's idyllic. And that is the, his pre-war childhood. Um, in the village, uh, in the home county somewhere, and um, I, I, my guess is that he used a lot of uh, his, his early life in, in, in that book. Bob? What do you think of the idea that national socialists must necessarily be natural allies of other national socialists? For example, in this country, the uh, socialist movement, Mosley and others, now, there was a man who would have fought, who would have fought and risked his life to be in a British regiment fighting the Germans. Now, why on earth should you, should you sign up with them? It's a silly idea that uh, you would, oh, we believe in the same things, therefore, what? Well, well. um, 
Yes, I mean, it, 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 it's a tricky one, that, isn't it? Um, always said he always, sorry, um, Mosley always said he would have fought for the British against uh, Germany. And uh, I think I, I think he meant it. I mean, there are oh, sure. um, communists fight communists, of course. Uh, the Soviet Union and the Chinese had a war. Uh, the Vietnamese and the Chinese had a war. So uh, nationalism is a very powerful force, and you, you, it, it, it will uh, it will transcend um, ideology. <laughs> But there is, you know, there is obviously something in it, you know. Uh, initially, it, uh, Mussolini was um, very suspicious of Hitler. And um, he was amenable to an alliance or a, um, an agreement with France and, um, and uh, Britain. Uh, but it didn't come to that. And I think they, uh, Hitler and Mussolini became quite friendly. And I think that was something to do with, certainly something to do with their uh, common view of looking at the world. Of course, I can't be sure that had Hitler had one a quick invasion, the Mosley wouldn't have been part of the apparatus of state. So I'm not a pro Mosley, obviously. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You know, you you, you would have. Well, I think Mosley's pretty upfront about being a patriot, and he's not going to fight against his country. Whoever it is, no matter how sympathetic he is. I think the position is really that someone like Mosley would have been much more amenable to a peace treaty with Germany, wouldn't it? Yes. In 1940. Uh, whereas the uh, Churchill government uh, wasn't. But um, Mosley would have been in favour of uh, making peace with uh, Germany. As was Lloyd George, of course. You know, Mosley wouldn't have been the only one. Especially if Germany turned to the east and as was Hitler, you know, just lost yes, himself over there. Well, I mean, Germany was, um, I mean, we're moving on a bit, little bit off all now, but Germany was, its plan was to uh, invade the Soviet Union uh, and use the um, Ukraine as a, a breadbasket, and what happened in the West, it was just a sideshow, really. Hitler wanted to get it over with, get it done, and uh, he could get back to um, the main uh, the main plan, and um, you know I think it was just uh, fate that uh, I think if the British politicians had been been a bit more sensible, they would have seen this. And um, I mean, Baldwin said in um, the mid 1930s, he says if anybody should do the any fighting in Europe. I think it should be the Nazis and the Bolsheviks. And I think he was right. Anyone else? Oh. I have to say this. For, oh, oh, sorry. Oh. Here, yeah. I just have to say this from a naive standpoint. I was wondering why, why Hitler invaded Russia after Napoleon's very obvious defeat. I think you may have clarified that point. Well, he, he, thought, the, uh, he thought the Soviet Union was just uh, hopeless, you know. Uh, what did he say? What was the... What no, was he he said? Kick out the door. He, all he had to do is kick out the door and the roof will fall in. You know, he, 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 he thought it was a, totally a, a slave state and everybody would, r would rise up. But, of course, people did rise up when the Germans invaded. You know, the Western Ukraine particularly uh, and... Um, uh, other places, but of course the Germans were interested in um, m harnessing the, uh, these people, and they, they, uh, they you know, they, their plan was to to form a, um, a colony. Because um, Hitler had this idea, didn't he? This idea that um, in order to survive as a nation, you had to have a decent land area. And you had to be able to feed yourself. He was an economic uh, otaki. And, um, you know, he could see the, the, uh, the Americans and the British Empire and other countries. And the Japanese had the same idea. That was, that was the motive behind their invasion of um, Manchuria and China. And it's ridiculous, I think. But uh, there he was. That, that was his plan. And why did he uh, do it? Well, he explained it all in Mein Kampf, actually. If you have a look at it, he um, he said, 
Germany has to have Lebensraum, as he called it. And uh, it's just fortuitous that history has placed uh, Russia in its present state for us. In other words, the Bolsheviks have taken over. They're totally useless. Uh, they'll just, the whole place will just fall, fall down like a house of cards. We'll just go in and that'll be that. What's wrong with living rooms? <laughs> yes. Well, the silly, that silly idea still obtains that you can't be a, you can't be a tiny state. That's just <laughs> it's like you have to be something like the EU, big right. state, bigger the better, yeah. bigger the better. Yes. The rest of the world that you can train with, and it doesn't really count. You can't be sure. Of you have, put you tariffs have, up against them. You have to be part, and if you can't be a big country. <laughs> You have to be part of a big club. That's right, yeah. Like the EU. It was presented cool. to me in a Nigerian factory about 40 years ago that one of the reasons that uh, America could survive industrially was that when you had to manufacture it, you had to settle two lap for it, which was a capital investment cost that preceded the production and that you need the big market for it to be cost effective. And that was an argument for Europe, where you could theoretically to produce something economically on a, on a, with, a, with an economy of scale. And that with, with a market the size of Europe, Britain could also produce uh, uh, in the way that, in fact, didn't seem to happen under Margaret Thatcher. But uh, if that is an argument, is that part of the economic benefit of a large area of influence, or has that been superseded? Well, you're looking for uh, access to markets, that's true, but you don't have to be part of a uh, something like the EU to have that. I mean, lots of, um, there are lots of countries uh, in the world which are quite small and um, uh, are quite successful. There's something bigger than the whole world. If you're trading with the whole world, Thing. Switzerland used to have the biggest firms in the world. In fact, uh, for a long time, Nestle's or Nestle, as they now call it, was the biggest firm in the world. I mean, it still is. Isn't, isn't Switzerland a vassal state of the US, effectively? We look at it, roll over with the financial privacy stuff. Yeah. Quite recently. Speaker's areas of expertise. Or is it ours? Any, any, any more comments? Yeah. Have you got anything to say, Steve? Well, I would say I'm feeling quite thirsty. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> right th thanks a lot, Stephen.